thank you so much for bringing into this conversation uh, the class aspect of, of uh, what we are seeing and reckoning with, right? I think the victims were not only targeted because they were Asian American and they were women, but also because of the work they did as, as women that worked low income jobs. And, you know, one of the things I haven't been able to stop doing is crying every time I think about, especially the older Korean women, because I think about my own grandma, you know, I think about my grandma working job, a really difficult job at that age. And, you know, they're at the age where they should be enjoying life at a nursing home, you know, playing cards, playing mahjong, you know, going for walks with their friends. And I think that there's so many in the Asian American community, especially women who work in working class that are completely invisible as human beings. So thank you so much for bringing them and naming them and bringing them into the space, Aijin. What about you, Teresa or Representative Meng? Who do you wanna bring into the space and recognize and honor? So I will say I am thankful for the people that we're honoring, including our Asian American journalists because they've sort of allowed us to finally recognize that the women in our lives, the jobs that they hold and the sacrifices that they've made, um, that it's normal and it's a part of our history. It's a part of American history. And, you know, we don't have to like be embarrassed anymore. Um, I have a really clear <clears throat> memory of when I was a kid and my parents, they were wearing their like, restaurant clothes and came to like PTA conference and I was too embarrassed to say hi to them because of what they were wearing and I didn't want people to think I mean I was the only Asian would have wouldn't have been that hard to figure out they were my parents <laughs> but you know I was embarrassed because those weren't normal American mom and dad clothes right and so I always remember that I want to ask you all a, a question about like how does how does that particular conversation around the hypersexualization? I mean, that's the piece that the reporters are most appalled by, right? That they're like, oh my gosh, like you get harassed because of your because of your Korean ethnicity. Like they had no idea. And so when you're hearing this, like, how are you feeling about this? Our very personal, what you know, what we've been expected to be ashamed of now coming out so publicly and being out there for, for the world to know, um, how has that been making you, how are you processing that and how has that been making you feel? I mean, I think um, it definitely brings back all the years and years of experiences um, and, you know, working in a restaurant and getting told that um, I remind them of a, the geisha that was in their dream last night. And, you know, just the, 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 the small and the large um, violations of your basic human dignity uh, and your humanity that happen as a result of that kind of sexualized and racialized um, ways in which you're defined um, in these cultural norms. And um, and so, yeah, it's just like flashes of all the, all the times, all the comments, all the, and then one of the things that I've been seeing is online, so many API women just speaking their truths about those experiences and laying them bare and so many stories online. And I think that that's a really important part of our, both our healing, our reckoning and of moving forward until we can actually talk about the dehumanization and all of its forms and what it means, what it does to your spirit as a human being. Um, and yeah, that that and that the the real cost to your emotional and mental health um, until we can actually get there, I think it's going to be really hard to make progress. So as traumatic and re-traumatizing as it all is and as hard as it is right to kind of speak this truth, it feels like a really, really important part of the process. And 
a, a part of both the release that needs to happen and the healing. Yeah, I would say that as tragic as the murders of the six Asian women in Atlanta were, um, part of their legacy is that they have uplifted Asian American women and generations of Asian American women where we are no longer objects, we are no longer on a lower level and subhuman um, compared to other people in this country. And that's just been something really difficult to even fathom or understand. I mean, I don't think I consciously thought that Asian women were not as you know, normal and the same as other women and other people, but it's just kind of always been in our subconscious. I remember in high school, like someone said to me, oh, you're pretty for an Asian. Not I, like I was happy for weeks. I was like, oh my gosh, I got complimented. And then as I grew older, I'm like, that was such an insult. Um, but we're finally in a place where we realize our worth, the moms and the grandmas who came ahead of us, we now can publicly appreciate um, and know their worth. Thank you so much for sharing that story because I have, I have, I have been, people have told me that exact same thing. Like it is so common. It is so common. And you think like at first, oh, they gave me a compliment, but it's actually incredibly backwards and incredibly offensive. Similar thing with the concept of hypersexualization. People are like, oh, aren't you happy that you're perceived as attractive or, or, or in a sexual way? I'm like, no, because I'm being objectified. I'm not being seen as fully human in all my full aspects. And, and, and it just reminds me of this one time where I was in Florida and, um, I, there was this, I was walking up to the cashier and it was an old white man who, who had uh, rung me up and he took a look at me and he was like, are you an oriental? You look like an oriental. Oh, my wife's an oriental. I love them. I love them. And then he grabbed my arm and he was just like, I love them. You know, orientals, they're my favorite people. And the thing is you, you hear this now and it's, it's kind of funny, but in that moment, I was honestly very terrified. I was like 14 right? I was a minor. Um, I was with my parents, but my parents were like all around over the store, you know, I had a younger sister. We were the only Asian people in the store and I was taking up the responsibility to run our stuff. And that's, it was honestly very terrifying. I was like shaking, physically shaking after we left the store. I was just a young girl and I, and it was so vivid and it's so, it stuck with me until today where I'm like 22 now. And I still remember it to this day, that moment of just feeling so disgusted and objectified and just so like viewed and in, in a one-dimensional way um and 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 specifically just also speaking as like you know we talk about asian americans but also there are very different you know we have differences within the community itself like between east asians and southeast asians and south asians and so i would like to recognize those differences and and how those differences make our our community um stronger and better and and you know, just speaking as a Southeast Asian woman, I tend to, the stereotypes are different for me as a Southeast Asian woman, right? Versus what being East Asian, where I'm, I tell people like, oh yeah, I'm Vietnamese and they automatically think I'm some, I come from some jungle environment or that my parents come from some jungle environment or, you know, some people, they look at me and I also will have to recognize people, white people will not, do not care the differences between the different Southeast Asian or East Asian. They'll just say, oh, you look Asian. And so they're going to hypersexualize you and perceive you as East Asian, because that is the predominant Asian demographic in media. And so um, I've definitely have felt very much just so not seen in my full, full, in, in all of my full elements, you know, like just, just not seen and, and validated in that way. Um, and, and that often manifests, especially when I'm the only Asian person in a predominantly white space where I often have to be that one voice to advocate or, or share my perspective as like one Asian person in this perspective, like, hey, let me bring this issue because nobody else is talking about it. And I often, it's exhausting work and it also feels like tokenizing, right? It feels, and then, and then when you buck against those stereotypes of like Asian women being perceived or, or misconceived as um, uh, demure and passive when you are, um, you know, demanding and you are, um, you know, you, you say it like it is, you are opinionated, you are straightforward, you're blunt, 
um, then people suddenly are like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like you do not fit within my conception of you. You are not, yeah. you know, you are not my, the Asian that I thought you were. You are not Asian, right? Because eight, my, my conception of being Asian is the stereotypical one dimensional, quite frankly, very offensive per perception. Um, and the thing is, it, it makes me think of like this sort of other stereotype that Asian women aren't political, that we're not like, you yeah. know, that we've never been, we haven't been speaking about this stuff and raising issues about this stuff until now. Right. Yeah. And it's like, no, we have been doing this since the beginning and the conception of this country, since we've been allowed to immigrate into this country, we've been raising our voices, you know, protesting, yeah. fighting everything. So I just want to recognize that we've been given this bullhorn right now. And I want to make sure that we don't, um, we that we are connecting in very genuine ways in solidarity with other women of color communities, right? Because um, all of us, all women of color are hypersexualized in some way or form. And, and um, I think that's a really important conversation to bring in. Um, and so if either of you have, you know, would like to provide your perspective on how you've connected and you know, in your life's work, or even as you're thinking about this last week, what are some suggestions you have for our listeners who are Asian American women who are maybe awakening to uh, uh, um, being more politicized and how do we include other women of color, especially those who are victims to sexual violence? You know, there is a, in, an entire organization dedicated to looking for um, missing indigenous women because the frankly, the, the law enforcement couldn't care less about their lives. And they're black women that are going missing all the time that no one, no one is paying attention to and no one is listening to. And I feel like we do need to use this platform and this moment to uplift stories in other communities too. So I'd like to turn it over to you for uh, some comments. Um, well, I'll just say that I think it's really important for us to think about what's happening in terms of power. That our world is shaped by a hierarchy, multiple hierarchies of power that are operating all at the same time, white supremacy, misogyny, and these hierarchies of power have racialized different groups of people of color and women of color differently, but the aim is to keep that hierarchy in place. And the only way to disrupt it and to change it frankly, is for us to be building power and building power together with other women of color, other communities of color. And there's so much history of that work to be building on. My mentor, Linda Burnham, founded the Women of Color Resource Center. At the time, it was one of the first, first organizations to even really use that term, women of color. But that term is really important because it is about power. <laughs> it is about naming the ways in which white supremacy and misogyny work together to disempower and disenfranchise different groups of women of color differently. And if we can actually break through and see our potential power together, that is what will be required to undo and disrupt the hierarchy that keeps us all in positions of vulnerability and, and abuse. And, and, and the only way that we unlock that dynamic is together. Um, so, you know, and just as long as we've been shouting out journalists, I just wanna shout out um, Nicole Hannah-Jones from the New York Times. Uh, she's been doing a, f a few different um, threads on her Twitter feed who that really talk about the relationship between how Black Americans and Asian and Pacific Islander Americans have been racialized, their role in the economy, how both groups were really brought here originally as cheaper free labor and never meant to be full citizens, right? And that if we are to create a multiracial, truly multiracial democracy in this country, we have to understand that history and we have to actively try to replace those narratives, try to replace those patterns and policies with new ones. Again, the only way we do that is together. <laughs>